It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. Times, they are a-changing in the world of outdoors communication. Newspaper columnists specializing in regular fishing and hunting contributions are becoming an endangered species, and some people will tell you that newspapers themselves are not far behind when it comes to being listed as such, though... I personally think newspapers as an institution will continue to be with us for quite some time, at least in digital form, if nothing else. Now, if they would only bring back the outdoors to their readers, they might be doing a little bit better. There's changes in the outdoors magazine industry, too. Outdoor Life, that iconic publication, quietly announced this edition that they are no longer going to be a monthly publication, but instead will only be coming out four times a year. Editorial director Anthony Licata says they are doing this because readers are asking for more photos and more information in the form of longer articles about fishing, hunting, and shooting. There's no mention as to whether economics is driving this or not, but I will give Mr. Licata and the Outdoor Life staff some credit. They said, The quarterly editions are going to be bigger, and they're not kidding. The inaugural spring edition of Outdoor Life comes in at 130 pages, nearly double compared to the 70-page April edition I've got stashed away from last year. And I've got to admit, there's some very good photography and some great stories to be found in the newest edition of Outdoor Life. To include an article called Anglers on a Train from Dave Karzinski, a great piece about Jack O'Connor's perfect Model 70 rifle from Oregon Outdoors writer Gary Lewis, and some great photography shot during an Alaska fishing trip by Steve McGrath, who escaped from his marketing duties in Utah with Signature Products Group to head for the last frontier with his son and Anthony Licata for a great adventure documented in a story called Boys in Big Country. By the way, one thing Dave, Steve, and Gary all have in common is they have all been guests on this show. They are passionate outdoorsmen, and they're also some really good guys. So to see their work in one of the finest outdoors publications out there, well, that's just pretty cool. My take, the quarterly editions, they're worth the wait between issues, and the first one gets a big thumbs up from me. This week on America Outdoors Radio, we'll be talking to guests in Tennessee, Oregon, and Missouri about a wide variety of fishing and hunting topics. Our guest from the Volunteer State is Chad Hoover, the founder and CEO of Kayak Bass Fishing. They just held their championship tournament on Kentucky Lake, bordering Tennessee and Kentucky, and had some 700-plus anglers paddling and competing for a $100,000 first place paycheck. Chad will tell you who came out on top and more about this exciting new fishing circuit where $50,000 plus bass boats are not required to compete. We'll switch from bass to bait fish when we talk to Steve Marks with the Pew Charitable Trust. They are shining a light on forage fish, the kind of fish that salmon and other big fish prey on. Chinook salmon stocks are in decline right now from Alaska to Northern California in a lack of management and science about forage fish like anchovy and herring may be a contributing factor. We've got a rare dose of good news for sportsmen and women from Washington, D.C. to share with you this week. A couple of new contestants who are breaking wildlife laws and walking our trail of shame. And another conversation from that Missouri deer hunter and deer habitat management guru, Alan Horntager Morris. Two weeks ago, we talked about buying your very own deer hunting property. If you took his advice to heart, you may have gone out and done that. And now you're wondering, what do I do now? That's why we're bringing Alan back, because he's going to tell you exactly what to do to attract trophy bucks to your very own private deer hunting Shangri-La. Come this fall, you'll be pulling the trigger or letting loose an arrow at a fine white tail, and then your only problem will be finding it in the fading light. Fortunately, we've got someone to help you with that little problem, too. 
Next on America Outdoors Radio, we are checking in with Eric Overstreet. He works for Leupold and Stevens, located in Beaverton, Oregon. They're very well known for making quality rifle scopes and binoculars, but they've got something that is new to help you find game that maybe you downed uh, right at dusk. And, and everyone knows that it sure would be nice if that deer just fell where you shot it, but that's not the way it usually works. And it can be really tough sometimes to find that animal once it runs off in the brush. Eric, welcome to the show. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for having me on. So, Eric, the LTO tracker came out about a year ago from Leupold, and this was designed specifically to help hunters find game in these situations. Tell our listeners more about it. Uh, yes, it's a little handheld thermal device, about five inches long. We have variable color palettes, uh, so each user can find what they prefer the most and uh, carry it with them in the field, and then uh, if they shoot an animal at, at last light, this uh, should increase their odds of being able to recover it. The original LTO tracker, how far out could you actually see a heat signature off a, a deer or other animal that you downed? There are a lot of variables that go into determining that. A lot of it depends on size and the ambient temperature. But for a whitetail hunter, uh, who's hunting in the winter or in the fall, uh, I think a reasonable distance for a white-tailed deer should be around 150 yards. All right. Well, that's very interesting to me. So uh, you mentioned size. So I'm a bird hunter, and let's say I'm gunning for quail. I'm guessing that LTO tracker, if size matters, is not going to help me too much finding a quail that I downed in the sagebrush. Uh, <laughs> so I'll tell you, for birds... Those feathers do a great job of insulating them. Uh, you will be able to see their head and their feet, uh, but you will not have a good chance at seeing their body. The birds are very different from deer. Uh, the feather is a lot more insulating than fur is. All right. I was kind of joking there, uh, but the, the bottom line, though, is that uh, this sounds like a great tool for a hunter to have, and at five inches, it fits right in your shirt pocket, but uh, you guys are always working to improve your products, and you've already came out with an improvement, the LTO Tracker HD. What's different about the HD compared to the original Tracker that only came out a year ago? Yeah, well, in the world of uh, technology, things move fast these days. Uh, with the new Tracker HD, we increased the sensor on the inside, so you, we have twice the resolution for image capture. And then we also increased the display resolution. Uh, so what we're outputting to the display is a lot clearer and crisper image. So educate me because I'm a Luddite. Does this basically mean that I can see that deer better further out at night? You will be able to get an increase in distance. Uh, I think 25% is probably a reasonable distance improvement, but you're also going to have a lot better identification capability. So maybe rather than just seeing a heat blob out there, you'll be able to see legs on it and maybe identify whether or not it's a coyote or a deer. So Eric, I understand in addition to the increased resolution that this is also a little bit more rugged than the original LTO tracker, which I thought was plenty rugged already. That's correct. We added a uh, Gorilla Glass coating uh, on the window cover for the display. So if you ca carry it around in your pack or your pocket, uh, the product is going to be a little bit more loopholeized. One other thing we need to talk about, the tracker does have a reticle in it, but it's not meant to be mounted on a rifle, is it? Uh, that is correct. Uh, the, the product is not rated for recoil. All right. How much does the LTO Tracker HD cost, and is it available in stores now? It is available in stores, uh, and it retails for $9.99. And folks, you're going to find that even though the retail is $9.99, a lot of those big box stores, the Cabela's, the Sportsman's Warehouse, the Bass Pro, uh, they're going to carry it at a lower price quite often. Again, it's the LTO Tracker HD, the new and improved pocket size thermal monocular you can carry with you so that when you down that deer, that elk, that bear, that coyote, at last light, you can actually go find that critter and do it a lot easier than you ever could before. Eric, thanks for telling us about this today on America Outdoors Radio. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on.
Last Christmas, we gave away a certificate for a stay at Shiloh Inn, a strong supporter of both of our radio programs. The winner was Blake Miller. He tunes into our show on News Talk KBND 1110 out of Bend, Oregon. Blake and his wife, Kathy, just used their certificate and sent me a note about it, writing, Kathy and I wanted to get back to you about our Christmas present from Shiloh Inns. After several scheduling false starts on my part, we made it to the Newport, Oregon Shiloh Inn last week. We had just a super room with an incredible oceanfront view with wonderful access to the beach that was much appreciated by my Labrador Retriever. The inn staff was wonderful, and the front desk ladies went out of their way to make our stay enjoyable. Thank you so much for such a fine Christmas drawing. Blake, that was our pleasure, and with three oceanfront locations in Oregon and Washington, along with some 20 other properties in the western United States, Shiloh Inns really does live up to their motto of offering affordable excellence. You can book a stay yourself through their website at shilohinns.com. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers 7th Annual Rendezvous is coming to Boise, Idaho, April 12th to the 14th. For tickets, go to backcountryhunters.org. Looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer an affordable platform to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting host John Cruz through his website at AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. But hurry, if you wait too long, this big opportunity might just get away. That's AmericanOutdoorsRadio.com. You're back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. And two weeks ago, there was a bass fishing tournament on Kentucky Lake, bordering the states of Tennessee and Kentucky. And this isn't unusual. There's lots of bass tournaments held here. What was unusual, though, was the winning prize, a cool hundred grand, as well as the boats the anglers were using. These weren't your typical bass boats. Nope. They were all fishing kayaks, and with us here to tell you more about this championship tournament is Chad Hoover, the founder and president of Kayak Bass Fishing. Chad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Well, we're glad to have you on board. Why don't you tell our listeners the, the, a little bit about the Kayak Bass Fishing National Championship and who came out on top? So the Kayak Bass Fishing National Championship is a culmination of a nationwide series of four different levels. We've got an online series, we've got partner groups, we have a trail, and then we have our open series. Those tournaments are all qualifiers. Uh, so basically the top 10% of anglers roughly uh, are the ones that are out there gunning for the national championship. So 750 anglers was the final number. We had a few that had to drop out because of weather or mechanical issues on the last couple of days. 750 was the final number, and a gentleman named Dwayne Taft out of Houston, Texas, came out on top and took home the $100,000 prize. And what was he using, if you know, uh, to go ahead and come out on top? It's really simple. Normally, I have to talk through four, five, six presentations, a strategy change, a move. Dwayne made it really simple for me. He fished the entire time in less than four foot of water, throwing a Z-Man jackhammer chatterbait with a Zayco trailer from Yamamoto. Now, he didn't just throw the same lure, he threw the same lure. In other words, every fish he caught came on the exact same lure. He never retied. He picked up another rod three or four times to to mix it up a bit when the bite slowed down, but every fish he put on the board that contributed to him winning the title came on a a Z-Man jackhammer uh, chatterbait and a a Zayco uh, swimbait trailer from Yamamoto Plastics. So it was a real easy one. (laughs) That's amazing. I've, I've never heard that before. Uh, I'm like you. I'm used to different presentations and the whole nine yards, but the same, the exact same lure. That's incredible. I want to get back to something here. 750 competitors. That's a big, big field. And if that's 10%, that tells me what, there's 7,500 people that participate in the kayak bass fishing tournament circuit? Well, actually, it's 10% of ones that can participate consistently. Uh, by our best guesstimations, uh, and the reason that I say that is some people are duplicated 
uh, with different login names, and they paid with their wife's credit card and things like that. So we've, we've got the system refined this year to have a better number. Uh, but our guess last year is that it was closer to 12,000 uh, unique competitors that competed in kayak bass fishing, partner affiliates, uh, trails, online series, or opens. So it's a growing crowd. And this isn't just a growing crowd, it's a nationwide crowd. Now, when I think of kayak bass fishing, I usually think of this happening down in the south or back east, but it's happening out in the western U.S. too, isn't it? Uh, Man, it's happening everywhere. Um, I got an email, ironically enough, last night from the president of the FLW Association out of Brazil and said that he wanted to establish an agreement where he could pay for his angler to come fish my championship, his, his angler of the year. We've got Canadians, we've got 40 plus states, well 40 exactly, states were represented this year. Um, There are growing groups, clubs, and trails uh, in almost every state in the continental United States. Spain just threw their hat in the arena. We're having a European championship later this year. It's really become almost a worldwide phenomenon, not just uh, an outside of the southeast kind of a thing. In fact, some of the bigger communities are in the Great Lakes area. The northern part of California and the Delta is really booming. Here in my home state of Tennessee, it's unbelievable. You know, it's it's everywhere. And, and realistically, I don't see it stopping anytime soon. It's just a, a very affordable way to fish. It's a very effective way to fish. Uh, and it's, you know what, man, just the part that we overlook, probably more so than anything else when we get serious, talking about tournaments and effectiveness and all that other stuff, it's a fun way to fish. It really is. It, it's it's a, just a different unique fun way to fish and uh that's what makes it so addicting well uh, if it isn't fun why would we be doing this i i agree with you completely love the concept folks you're listening to america outdoors radio we're talking to chad hoover he is the founder and president of kayak bass fishing and we just talked about the kayak bass fishing national championship and the winner who took home a hundred thousand dollars let's switch topics a little bit let's talk about the evolution of kayaks that are used in these tournaments i mean it used to be you know when when fishing kayaks first came out they were basically sitting in kayaks and then they became sit on top kayaks where you had a couple of you know rod holders right behind you and a, and a milk crate that you would have right behind your seat and then all of a sudden Hobie came out with the pedal driven ones and now we've got something called the torpedo uh, does anyone still paddle around the lake and catch fish in a tournament or are, are we way beyond that at this point yeah you know ironically enough uh, a lot of people paddle you know we had three of the top 10 uh, had motorized kayaks, but what kind of gets lost in the transition of the comparison between pedal power and paddle is that, for the most part, everybody still paddles. You know, think of it like this. In the bass fishing world, you use your big motor to get somewhere, and then you use your trolling motor when you get there to to catch fish. By and large, kayak fishing is the other way around. We use the electric motor. Uh, a lot of people call the Torquedo a trolling motor, but it's not. It's actually an electric uh, outboard. Um, and so it's not designed for trolling along to catch the fish. You can do that. Uh, personally, I use the motor to get where I'm going. I raise it up. I get it out of the water. Then pick up my rod. I pick up my paddle. And I catch fish a lot quieter, a lot more stealthy. You know, I think it's funny how all of us as bass fishermen know that a, a bass can feel the vibration of a spinnerbait blade or a lipless crank through its lateral line, you know, from upwards of 100 feet yet we run a trolling motor trying to catch fish and think that they can't feel that vibration. So the motor is really a method to get to the fishing spot. Most anglers are shutting that motor down and then fishing with the paddle when they get there. So our paddle is our trolling motor, and our trolling motor is our outboard, if you want to you know, make it make sense to the way that most of us fish. So, Chad, we've only got about 30 seconds left. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about exactly what the Torquedo is? Is this a motor or is this a kayak brand? So the Torquedo is the motor, and it's not just a motor. There are other motors out there, but the Torquedo is the first motor and the only motor that was designed specifically for kayaks. But it's not just a motor. It's actually a system. It is a lightweight, uh, waterproof battery with the GPS integration uh, and a system that tells you your range, your speed, and a number of other factors and a throttle system that controls it. So the entire system uh, is designed to work with the kayak. It weighs in at just under 22 pounds for the new upgraded version, and the previous version and the the lower capacity battery weighs in at under 16 pounds. So it's a complete system 
designed to motorize your kayak and Torquedo makes the motor they don't make the kayak but uh, almost every major kayak out there can be adapted to fit the Torquedo motor system. Fascinating stuff the evolution of kayaks the evolution of kayak fishing and the evolution of this tournament as well this tournament series from kayak bass fishing we have got to go but let's give folks a website where they can find out more about kayak bass fishing and maybe join in on the fun. Man, head over to kayakbassfishing.com. If you want to join in on the fun, just click on the events tab and find an event near you. That's kayakbassfishing.com. That's your first stop to find out more about the sport of catching bass out of kayaks and competing at the same time. Chad, thanks for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. If you consider yourself a hardcore fisherman who takes pride in being the first person on the water and the last one off, Fish Fighter products were designed for you. We make products for the relentless fishermen who know that big fish are caught by those who put in the work. With our relentless series tackle trays, rocket launcher rod racks, and breakaway river anchors, you'll spend more time chasing the fish, not your gear. Designed and built right here in the USA, Fish Fighter products won't let you down. Gear up at fishfighterproducts.com. Why book at Sportsman's Cove Lodge? Why is Alaska like no other place on earth? It hasn't changed in thousands of years. From the way you get here on a float plane to the way you go out with the guides and the boats, it's just a professional experience. And I said, this is as good as it gets. I said, if you can't catch fish here, you can't catch fish anywhere. Your experience with us will leave you speechless. Book now at alaskasbestlodge.com. You're back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We're going to talk a little bit about conservation, and it's not what you think. We're going to start off uh, by telling you about salmon stocks. At least along the Pacific Coast, Chinook salmon are not doing really good in Northern California, along the Oregon coast, along the Washington coast, and now we're hearing bad news out of Southeast Alaska. Orca whales are having some real problems in Puget Sound. These orca whales feed on salmon. So what's the common denominator? Well, it may be the fish that the salmon feed on. That could be one of the reasons why we're seeing less salmon and why these orca whales whales are in trouble. With us here to tell you about forage fish in the Pacific and in the Atlantic too is Steve Marks. He's a forage fish expert with Pew Charitable Trust. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. So Steve, sorry about the long lead in there, but I really wanted to get people to thinking about one of the reasons why our Chinook stocks along the Pacific coast are declining. And it really has to do with the the fish that these salmon eat. At least that's one reason among many. And we're talking about candlefish, we're talking about herring, and we're talking about anchovy. How are these forage fish doing in terms of population? Well, we really don't know for sure. There are pretty robust and rigorous assessment for species like sardine, but for species such as anchovy, herring, and candlefish or ulicon, we don't really know a lot. I and mean, that's one because, you know, it, it's hard to survey these species, uh, but, but additionally, they are so highly variable in their abundance um, that they can boom and bust from year to year. So unless you have super up-to-date information on the status of those stocks, um, your management is is going to be um, is not going to reflect what the current status is. So that's what makes it so hard to manage these species is the lack of um, up-to-date information. Right now, um, with respect to anchovy in particular, we know that they crashed a few years ago, not due to fishing, but basically due to environmental conditions. And that was right during the time when we were hearing about uh, the unusual mortality event with sea lions. We were having bird breeding failures up and down the coast, and folks were seeing, you know, dead birds washing up on the shore. And um, there were some other signs that the ocean was telling us that it wasn't healthy in terms of forage fish. I and mean, it turns out that was, you know, that was synced up right with the crash of the anchovy population. However, in the last few years, that population has rebounded. It looks like they have experienced some recruitment events or some events where 
those larval fish turned into uh, mature adult fish. Um, and so things are looking better for anchovy, but they're certainly not back to the levels that they were in the heyday. And, you know, that is having an effect on a lot of the predator species that depend on those, those forage fish to get big and fat and healthy. And so we're seeing that reverberate throughout the ecosystem now. And, you know, scientists are still unpacking the story of what happened with the blob and what's going on with the ocean, what that means for both our forage fish stocks as well as for the fish that we like to go out and catch. So, Steve, a question for you here. You know, are salmon fisheries, whether it be the silvers or the kings, uh, as they call them up north, or the, the coho and the chinook, as we call them here in the continental U.S., very strict management? And it's done, you know, on a yearly basis. But forage fish like anchovies, I understand the last season setting for these because uh, we're a predator, too, of these fish was done, what, back in the 1990s and it hasn't changed since then? You're absolutely right, John. Yeah, the last formal assessment for what they call the central stock of northern anchovy, and that's the stock that extends from roughly Mexico and up into northern California and Oregon. And then there's a, a northern stock that hasn't had an assessment for even longer than that, and that's the stock that you find off of, you know, that's known around Grays Harbor, Willapa Bay, Columbia River Estuary. Um, you know, it's been even longer for that. But yeah, the, the last formal assessment was in was in the mid-90s. Um, and since then, what the, the managers have done in this case, it's the Pacific Fishery Management Council, um, and that's the, the, the governmental body that manages all of our federal fisheries off the West Coast. They kind of took a rough estimate of what the long-term average was for that population, set a number that they thought that would be sustainable over the long term, and then just forget it. So it, that catch limit, which uh, right now is 25,000 metric tons for that population, has been in place since then, You know, when, and we're, we're, we're hoping that they'll update it in the near future as these new tools and this new science becomes available to get a better idea of what the status of that stock is. You're listening to America Outdoors Radio. We're talking to Steve Marks. He's a forage fish expert with Pew Charitable Trust. And and Steve, I'm not a scientist, but you know, I'm scratching my head here because just from a common sense point of view, you, you've got to manage all the fish in the food chain and not just one like the salmon uh, because they all affect each other. Are they doing a better job on the East Coast than we are on the West Coast? Um, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, John. So be different people have different opinions. If you look at the way that we manage sardine, on example, for the West Coast, we've got what we've called a cutoff, and that is a biomass level below which there is no fishery. So, you know, they're looking at that um, assessment for sardine every year, and if it's below 150,000 tons, they won't even let folks go out and commercial fish them. So I think that that's pretty precautionary, and that's a, that's a, good, that's a good type of management. I mean, they're trying to figure out how that would work on the East Coast, in particular for species like menhaden, for which there's uh, massive fisheries both on the East East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as Atlantic herring, which is a, an industrial fishery in, in the Northeast. And so those fisheries are, you know, have been large scale going on for a while. There are some issues with those fisheries, um, in particular with the Menhaden fishery, and you've got guys that are really interested in striped bass and what's been happening with the striped bass population and the health of those fish and how that is tied to Menhaden numbers. So scientists out there are trying to create what they call ecosystem models to try and figure out how to sustainably manage that menhaden fishery over the long term and ensure that it's not having negative impacts on both sport fish like like striped bass as well as some of the bigger marine mammals like humpback whales and uh, north atlantic right whales and other you know big marine mammals and species that we care about that rely on these on, on menhaden um, and the atlantic fishery is going through what they call a management strategy evaluation process to think about the same sorts of things how do we manage these fisheries in a way that that leaves enough in the ocean for for all those other species that depend on it We've only got a minute left, but what is preventing fisheries managers at the federal or international level from doing a better job of managing these forage fish? I mean, if they can do it for the sardines, why can't they do it for the anchovy and the herring and the menhaden? Well, I think it gets down to... Um the science. Uh, so a lot of these species are what they call data poor, in particular anchovy out here. So we don't have a lot of information. I think that what it requires is both having better information and being willing to use the information that we have on anchovy out here. Um, in particular, there is um, the, the scientists are in need of what they call age data to determine the age structure of the population. They've got that data, but they haven't really processed it yet to incorporate it into management. Additionally, we need, we need to know more about when and where these species are being present 
preyed upon. So, um, for example, you can think about Sacramento River Chinook or Columbia River Chinook. You know, an anchovy may be just, you know, 25% of their diet, but it, it's the critical component of their diet during a certain period of year. So if we know when and where um, those predators are, are especially dependent on these species, we can manage our fisheries in a way to avoid that impact. So we need to um, be increasing diet studies and increasing our understanding of how these predators like salmon, like whales, like seabirds, when and where their dependency is greatest and when and where they're feeding on these species in order to be able to sustainably manage a, a commercial fishery on them. And when you don't know, you need to act with a lot of precaution. So w- when there is a data poor situation, uh, managers need to avoid that risk and make sure that the fisheries that they're managing aren't having that negative impact. I mean, that takes, you know, science and it takes commitment to doing the surveys, commitment to doing the research. And I think that, you know, we're trying to, to facilitate that out here. Um, and hopefully the same thing has happened on the East Coast. Well, Steve, we have got to go. But one thing this conversation has left me with is the knowledge that, you know, here I thought before having this chat uh, that we were so far along when it came to science and fisheries. And and now I realize we've still got a long ways to go. And folks, if you want to find out more about this subject, which is really fascinating, go to pewpewtrust.org and just search for forage fish. You'll find some great articles. That's pewtrust.org. Steve, thanks for keeping on top of this very critical situation. Hey, John, thanks very much. It was great to talk to you. There's a place where the fishing is year-round, where the sun shines 300 days a year. The wineries and breweries are right downtown. The hiking and cycling offer spectacular views you just don't get in the big cities. Fortunately, the place is real and vibrant. It's the Dalles, Oregon, just 90 short minutes from Portland, along the gorgeous Columbia River, where the adventures are limited only by your imagination. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. I'd like to welcome a new sponsor to our show. It's Sportsman's Cove Lodge, and many anglers who have been there will tell you it really is Alaska's best lodge. Sportsman's Cove Lodge sits on a salmon highway full of kings and silvers. There's halibut, too, and there are some really big ones. Finally, with decades of experience taking care of customers, Sportsman's Cove Lodge knows how to treat you right from start to finish. Ready to book your trip of a lifetime? Then call Sportsman's Cove Lodge at 800-962-7889. That's 800-962-7889. 800-962-7889 for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. If you consider yourself a hardcore fisherman who takes pride in being the first person on the water and the last one off, Fish Fighter products were designed for you. Fish Fighter products are used by the top fishing guides in the Northwest because they know having the right equipment is imperative to a successful fishing trip. With our relentless series tackle trays, rocket launcher rod racks, and breakaway river anchors, you'll spend more time chasing the fish, not your gear. Designed and built right here in the USA. Gear up at fishfighterproducts.com. Ty Stubblefield here from Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, reminding you of our 7th Annual North American Rendezvous, April 12th through the 14th in Boise, Idaho. Join us and special guests Randy Newberg, Ryan Callahan, Remy Warren, and Stephen Ranella for an event-filled weekend featuring backcountry seminars, our beers, bands, and public lands brew fest, and the world-famous storytelling night. All going on at the Boise Center, April 12th through the 14th. Get your tickets at backcountryhunters.org. Are you looking to reel in the marketing opportunity of a lifetime? Then set the hook because we've got it right here for you. America Outdoors Radio has sponsorships available, and we offer affordable platforms to reach thousands of listeners interested in fishing, hunting, and the outdoors. Find out more by contacting John Cruz through his website at americaoutdoorsradio.com. That's americaoutdoorsradio.com. Hurry, though. If you wait too long, the big opportunity might just get away. americaoutdoorsradio.com. 
That's the sound you hear when a fish hits the new sonic bait fish from Max Lure Company. This metal lure can be cast, trolled, or jigged, and will catch just about anything that swims in the sea, the river, or the lake. The sonic bait fish has a unique vibration and flutter that can be rigged in seven different ways. With all sorts of eye-catching colors and weights available, you'll be reaching for the sonic bait fish as your go-to lure. It's the sonic bait fish. And that's another fish on, only from Max Lure Company. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz, and we've got some outdoors news for you. And this segment is brought to you by Fish Fighter Products. They're located in Mountain Home, Idaho, and they are really innovative in terms of coming up with ideas to make your time on the water as an angler easier. A case in point is their quick mount. You can change out that bow anchor nest for a bow-mounted trolling motor from Minn Kota in a matter of seconds. Simply ingenious. Find out more at fishfighterproducts.com. Our lead story comes from our nation's capital, and for once, we've got good news for you out of Washington, D.C. Remember that big appropriations bill passed by Congress and signed by the president a couple of weeks ago? It not only had a bunch of money set aside to keep the government going and for defense spending, but it also had quite a few good things for you and me as outdoors enthusiasts and conservationists. Katie McCallop with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers did a great job of summarizing what's there, and I'm going to summarize it even more by telling you this. Three federal agencies, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Forest Service all got significant increases in funding, which is big news because we thought they were going to see decreases of funding again. Better still, a lot of the increases that we're seeing are going to be used to address maintenance backlogs. Those are things like campground maintenance, road maintenance, trail maintenance, things that have been swept under the rug and ignored for years and years because no money has been available for this. Another big win is a seven-year fix to the fire borrowing problem that addresses wildfire funding and forest management reforms. You see, in the past, all that money for fighting wildfires came right out of the Forest Service budget. And it was about 16% in the late 1970s, grew to over 50 plus percent in the last few years, leaving nothing except for payroll, and that was about it. Well, now that budget situation has been fixed, and the Forest Service can do the job they need to with the budget that they set out to use. There is also $425 million for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, really important for conservation issues throughout the United States. I don't say this often, but I'll say it today. To all of you senators and all of you representatives who voted to pass this, to Secretary of the Interior Ryan Sinke, to Sonny Perdue with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and to President Trump, thank you. You all did some very good things for the outdoors and the environment here. It's time for the Trail of Shame. Shame, shame on you. Shame, shame on you. This week, 67-year-old Edward Levine of Novato, California, is walking our trail of shame. From the Outdoors Daily News, we learn he's been sentenced to 27 months in prison. His crime? A violation of the Lacey Act. He sold two black rhinoceros horns to an undercover agent in Las Vegas, Nevada. Levine's not only going to prison... He's being prohibited from wildlife and antique sales as a result of the sentencing. Black rhinoceros, as you are probably aware, are extremely endangered. And the negotiated price of $55,000 probably seemed like good money to Levine until the cuffs were put on him. In a day and age where too many wildlife criminals seem to get off with fines and probation, it's nice to see a federal judge put the hammer down on people who traffic in poached animals like Edward Levine. Edward, enjoy your time in prison and enjoy your walk today on our trail of shame. Shame on you. 
Next on America Outdoors Radio, we've got Alan Horntager Morris back with us again. As you may recall, a couple of weeks ago, he joined us to give you information about buying your very own deer hunting property. He is the author of Whitetail Deer Management and The Weekend Hunter. He hails from Missouri, and we thought we'd bring him back. Good to have you on the show again, Alan. I appreciate you having me back on, John. So, Alan... Let's just say that some of our listeners took your advice to heart, and in the last two weeks, they went out and bought themselves 40-plus acres of deer property, and they're tuning in again so they can hear you tell them, now what? What do they do with all this property they've got? Well, the first thing I want to tell them is congratulations. They are now stewards of the land. They are as a historical figure as Aldo Leopold was. So the first thing you want to do is learn your property lines, and the first year, I like to sit back and sort of watch what's going on on the property. You know, that's interesting. And this kind of goes back to, to bosses I've had. There's two bosses. There's the machete man, as I call him, and I, I suspect this also applies to landowners, uh, who goes in and makes lots of changes in our flurry of activity. And then there's those that take their time, see what's going on, see what's working, and then they start tweaking things. And it sounds like that's what you're advocating here when it comes to managing your property. Yeah, if, if you're sitting there like turkey season's getting ready to come along and you've got turkeys roosting on your property and they like a, a historical roosting area, well, it would be a shame to bulldoze that area and put a food plot there. So, and the same with deer. Uh, deer have certain travel patterns across the property. Of course, that's going to change over time, but for the most part, they're there. Instead of uh, bulldozing or cutting out an area for a food plot or an orchard, you can move it maybe 20 feet and miss their deer trail and let the deer trail run beside it. Well, let's talk a little bit about building food plots and water sources. So let's say you've got a property that doesn't have a spring, doesn't have a creek that's really easy to go ahead and, and pattern the deer as they come to and from that area. How do you go about building a water source for the deer or do you? You always want to make a plan. That's the very first thing you do is you make a plan, what your plan is going to be for what equipment you have, how much money you have, the time you have, and all that neat stuff. And then in that plan, you look at your property and how the watershed is and where you may want to lay out food plots. And after the food plots is where you want to put that uh, little wildlife watering hole. We're not talking super big, you know, maybe 10 by 20 foot wide, something like that. Uh, the deeper, the better, because you have a less evaporation, and then that way, uh, uh, less surface area compared to the depth, and that way you, it never goes dry in a drought. So we're not talking about a stock tank. We're talking about actually bulldozing a small little pond or, or mini reservoir here. Correct. You know, uh, that's what deer like to roam up to a nice, quiet water source. That's the big deal. You don't want your water source up by camp. You want it in a nice, remote area where the deer can deer and the turkey can walk up to it comfortably without a uh, worrying about predators or the human predators. Okay. Now, we've talked about water, and I'm only going to give you a minute to talk about food sources. Are we talking about planting a mini orchard or something else? Uh, food plots are across, all across the board. You've got timber stand improvement. That will help uh, food inside the woods. You have edge feathering. That's going to help foods like blackberries along the edge. You're going to have the food plot itself. There's tons of different food plots. I always look for things that are forage and base or um, high grazing uh, made for those two specific things. And the food plot itself, there's a lot of different sources, and including orchards. I like uh, uh, chestnut trees and apple trees and crab apple trees, that type of thing. Unfortunately, Alan, we are running out of time, and, and I can just tell. We could spend an hour talking about this subject, but folks, you have to go buy the book if you want to find out more. It's called Whitetailed Deer Management and the Weekend Hunter. It's by Alan Horntager Morris. It's available on Amazon. It's also available on another website. What is that one, Alan? Uh, North American Wildlife and Habitat. There you go, folks. North American Wildlife and Habitat.com or Amazon.com. The title again, Whitetail Deer Management and the Weekend Hunter. A great resource if you want to buy and manage your very own quality whitetail deer habitat. Alan, thanks again for sharing this with us on America Outdoors Radio. I appreciate it, John. 
We've got to wrap things up, but we'd like to welcome some new listeners on board this week. Tuning into our show on 1310 WDOC AM out of Prestonburg, Kentucky. We're glad you're part of our 60 station network, and I hope you've enjoyed your first taste of America Outdoors Radio today. We'd also like to welcome some new listeners in the Rose City of Portland to our program. Now, we've been airing in much of Portland for several years now, but we've got a new home there on the AM dial. Talk 1640 The Patriot, which is sharing this show and our regional show, Northwestern Outdoors, every Saturday morning from 6 to 8. If you're looking for other ways to listen to our show, you can catch us online Saturday mornings at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on TalkAmericaRadio.us, the new voice of conservative talk radio on the Internet. We're proud to be part of their lineup. You can also catch us on the go on YouTube. Our channel there is Northwestern Outdoors, one word, or on on Podbean, where you can subscribe to America Outdoors Radio. Finally, we've got a Facebook page too, America Outdoors Radio, and our website, AmericaOutdoorsRadio.com. April's here, and even though there's still snow in some parts of our great United States, Flowers are blooming in other parts, turkeys are strutting, and the fish are biting. I hope you get out there and enjoy the early blessings that spring has to offer. Remember, it's your country and your outdoors. (laughs) 